Hi everyone and good morning. Welcome to our church on this beautiful Sunday morning. God bless you. Just a couple of announcements that I want to bring to your attention, particularly our Easter week services. Uh, so we're kicking it off today with our Palm Sunday service and I hope that it's meaningful and brings you into the Easter spirit. On Friday, we're going to be having a Good Friday service here at our church uh, at 10 o'clock. It's gonna be a reflective service with communion together. I hope that you can make it out for that on Friday morning. And then on Easter Sunday is going to be our pancake breakfast at nine o'clock. Come on out for that. And then our worship service at 10 o'clock that morning. Our other announcement is regarding our open cupboard because that's going to be happening the week after Easter. Uh, donations are going to be received here at the church on from Tuesday to Thursday of that week, April 11 to 13. Uh, then we're going to be sorting on Friday, April 14. Lots of volunteers are going to be needed for that. And then our open cupboard is going to be on Saturday, April 15. And if you could help with cleanup after that, man, we would really, really appreciate that. Uh, so Tuesday to Thursday are the donations, Friday is sorting, and then our open cupboard is on Saturday. God bless you as you uh, are involved in that ministry. We're looking forward to it. We're, we're, we're going to go to a time of prayer and then our connection time together. Please, please take your Bibles, turn in the Old Testament to Zechariah. I'm going to do a prophecy first. I'm reading from the New International Version, Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jer Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And then turn into the New Testament to Matthew, Matthew 21, reading verses 6 to 11. This is the, the detail. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. God has a blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. the city of Jerusalem. The events that follow will literally change the world. He rides through the crowd, not on a white horse, but on a borrowed donkey. The people bow down, shout Hosanna, and wait for his next move. The crowds not only place palm branches at his feet, but they also place on his shoulders their own expectations of a conquering king who will overthrow Rome. Jesus will not only disappoint them, he will disrupt them and will shatter their assumptions about power and justice. You're invited into a moment of reset and discovery because the events around the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus are the absolute answer to every longing heart. May God give us eyes to see. Well, thanks, Glenn, for our scripture reading this morning. Thank you for bringing that. Uh, so this morning and then this coming Friday and then on Sunday, we're spending our time looking at Jesus 
in light of the Holy Week uh, before Easter. And my goal and my prayer for us is that we can pause and we can reflect on who Jesus is. You know, there are many things that Jesus said about himself. He called himself the Son of God. He described himself as the suffering Messiah, uh, as the Savior of the world, as the King of his kingdom. And all of this became very, very real uh, during the week before his crucifixion. And so as we enter into this Holy Week, I invite you to see Jesus for who he really is. You know, we easily fall into a trap when we define, when we try to define Jesus how we would like to define Jesus. And it was done back then by the people of his day, and we continue to do it today. But who is Jesus? So today we're looking at the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. Today is Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday when we reflect uh, that the crowd gathered around Jesus and palm branches were waved in celebration of this king entering Jerusalem. Uh, but before we begin into all of this, would you stand with me and let's commit ourselves to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. And so as we look at your word today, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us. Who is Jesus? Well, you are a God who makes himself known. And Jesus, you made yourself known in this last week before Easter. So we look to you, Jesus. Would you speak to us this morning? And would we have ears to hear and minds to understand and hearts that would receive from you? We open ourselves to you. In your name, amen. Have a seat. Well, if I were to ask you a question this morning, what would be your response? If I ask you the question, who is the king of rock and roll? Your response would be Elvis. That's right. Good. Bonus points. Uh, now, Elvis was coined the king of rock and roll in the 50s because we like to declare people the king of something if they're the best at it, right? We like to put that crown onto people's heads. And so we say that Tiger Woods is the king of golf. And we say that Connor McDavid is the king of hockey. Well, Wayne Gretzky is kind of still the reigning king of hockey, but it looks like his records won't last forever. And as a side note, why does Edmonton get both of these players? Like, that's just not fair. It's not. I, yeah, I know, I know. Michael Jackson has been declared the king of pop. Clark Gable was declared the king of Hollywood. Now, I'm not too sure if that's all that great of a thing to be called nowadays, but maybe back then it meant something. But did you know that Elvis hated that title, the king of rock and roll? He hated it, and he did not want anyone around him to use it. So there was this time, there was a concert uh, there, when a, a woman hung a banner at the back that says, Elvis is king. And Elvis stopped the song right in the middle of the song, and he responded, there is only one king, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if someone called Elvis the king to his face, he would say, no, no, Jesus is the king. I'm just an entertainer. He was a deeply spiritual man, and you really saw this emerge in the latter part of his career. Elvis knew who was the king, and he knew that it wasn't him. Let me get this thing going. There we go. It all works. So we're taking a pause from the Armor of God sermon series that we're in the midst of, and we're focusing our attention on this holy week, this week that's leading up to Easter. And this morning, we're looking at the triumphal entry of Jesus, uh, this time when all these people gathered around him and they declared him to be the king of Israel. So the life and ministry of Jesus is recorded in four different books in the Bible, and we call them the Gospels. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each book was written by different authors for different circumstances, different audiences, and not every event in the life of Jesus is recorded in each book. But yet the final week of Jesus this week of Easter, this Holy Week, is recorded in all four books. And it's incredibly accurate. 
and it's incredibly detailed. There's more written about this last week of Jesus, between uh, this last week before Jesus' death, than it's written about the rest of his life. Obviously, it's really important. Because Easter defines who Jesus is. Easter is like a spotlight that shines on him. You know, all throughout Jesus' ministry, he kept alluding to his plans and purposes. And sometimes the disciples got it. Most of the time, they didn't. But in the week leading up to Easter, Jesus was blindingly clear about exactly who he is. And Jesus did this for a reason. Because we always want to define Jesus in our own light. We try very hard to place Jesus into a box that we like. We've tried it over the last 2,000 years. But we need to be honest and we look to, need to look at who Jesus really is. Because this is the pursuit of faith. This is the integrity of faith that we would constantly be trying to see Jesus for who he really is. You can only make up Jesus for so long before your image of him crumbles. You need to know the real Jesus. You need to know who Jesus really is. So there are a lot of events that happened in the week leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. And what we're looking at this morning, this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, this is the event that kind of kicked it all off. And we read about it in our scripture reading. And in this event, the crowd declares that Jesus was their king, which he was, but not in the way that they wanted him to be. So the story that Glenn read for us is that Jesus commissioned his disciples to find a colt that had never been ridden. And he was entering Jerusalem, and he specifically wanted to enter Jerusalem this way. And so the disciples found it, and they convinced the owner that it was needed by Jesus. And they put their cloaks on the donkey, on the colt, sorry, so that it was a little easier of a ride. And Jesus rode this colt into the city of Jerusalem. And the crowds picked up on this. Word got out quickly. In today's day and age, it would be trending on Twitter. But they began to gather all along the road. Massive crowds. The Bible says that the entire city was buzzing. And these crowds began to line the way that Jesus was riding into the city. And they waved palm branches. And they laid co their, their, their coats down. And they started, started to shout and proclaim, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is highly appropriate if you're welcoming a king into your city. It's a very ancient custom. If you're welcoming a king into your city and you're expecting him to take his throne, this is exactly what you would do. So the people were excited about this because they believed that Jesus was the prophesied king. And this was the other scripture that Glenn read this morning. It's a prophecy from the prophet Zechariah about the coming Messiah. And he wrote this, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The people of Israel had always understood Zechariah's prophecy to refer to the Messiah, that this is about God's anointed king. And the Jews know their scriptures well, and they would have picked up very quickly what Jesus was doing. And so when Jesus sat on that colt, not just any colt, but a purebred colt, he was presenting himself as Israel's promised king. By his actions, he was saying, I am the king that you're looking for. But there's more. It's more. There's more than just this one single prophecy that excited the crowd. Because some of them would have also remembered that when Solomon became Israel's king, he was presented on the donkey of his father David. And so when the people of Jerusalem see Jesus riding on this donkey, they say, Hosanna to the son of David because they're talking about exactly that, that Jesus is from the lineage of David. But there's even more. There's an even older prophecy that explains why Jesus rode on a donkey. Long before Zechariah, long before Solomon, Jacob pronounced this blessing on his son Judah. 
He said, the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. Jacob's prophecy, his blessing over his son, meant that Israel's true king would come from the tribe of Judah, and that in some way he would be associated with a colt or a donkey. Jesus is also from the tribe of Judah. So you have Jesus on this day, on a donkey, as Zechariah had prophesied, from the royal lineage of David, from the tribe of Judah, riding into Jerusalem as Israel's rightful king. You can kind of see why the crowd was the way that it was, right? We'd get excited about it too. So when I was a kid, Burger King had a slogan that just kind of stuck. And if you're old enough like me, uh, maybe you'll remember it too. Do you remember the Burger King slogan, have it your way? Show of hands. Okay, there's, uh, I don't feel so old. Uh, no. Uh, have it your way was Burger King's slogan, and they had it for a long time because McDonald's had their slogan. You know, their competition had their slogan. You remember the Big Mac song? Two all-beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Yeah, that one stuck in my head too. But McDonald's had their slogan that their burgers were always the same. They were always made the same. They always tasted the same. They were always packaged the same. So Burger King tries the opposite, that every burger could be unique to you. And so Burger King had their own song. They said, have it your way, have it your way, have it your way at Burger King. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce, special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us serve it your way. We can serve your broiled beef whopper, fresh with everything on topper, any way you think is proper, have it your way. <laughs> I, I had that written down. I, I, I don't have that one memorized. But we like having things our way, don't we? We like having things our way. The people who lined the streets of Jerusalem and they waved palm branches in the air and they praised his coming, they had their ideas of who Jesus was and what they wanted him to be. They wanted Jesus, but they wanted him their way. But one of the things that really stands out about Holy Week, this week before Easter, is the truth that Jesus refused to be forced into other people's ideas of who he should be. Jesus shows us who he really is. You know, most of us are very easily molded by what other people think. We're easily molded by what other people want us to be, and we conform to that way too easily, but not Jesus. Jesus doesn't conform. And so on that day, there were people that lined the road who wanted to fit their idea of who he should be. You know, even today, we want Jesus to fit the idea of who we think he should be. Some wanted him to be a teacher. You know, they had heard him on the lake shore. They had heard him talk in the temple. They had heard him talk about loving your enemies and practicing forgiveness and loved, and loved to listen to him. They loved his wisdom. As long as Jesus was a teacher, they could accept Jesus. You know, even today, the common way that people like to force Jesus into their way is to say that Jesus was a good teacher. He was a very good teacher. He was a very moral teacher. And he taught tolerance and love. But Jesus isn't just a teacher. Some people wanted Jesus to be a conformist. The scribes and the Pharisees and all the other religious leaders, they all wanted Jesus to conform to their ideas of how he should act and what he should teach and what he should do. And they had arguments with him and discussions with him and dialogues with him. And they were always hoping that Jesus would conform to their religious ideas and views, and Jesus wouldn't. You know, today people still want Jesus to conform to their ideas and their lifestyles. They want to dictate to Jesus what he should do, what Jesus should approve of. They want Jesus to conform to their ideas, and Jesus won't. Some people wanted him to be a revolutionary, you know, there were zealots in the city, and they were really excited to see Jesus arriving in Jerusalem. And they longed for him to take up arms and to throw off the oppressors of Rome. 
They wanted this Roman occupation to end. They wanted violence. They envisioned Jesus as the head of a mighty army that would destroy their oppressors and bring about a kingdom. You know, today there are many people that want Jesus to be their leader and to support their opposition to things that they don't agree with. Government, culture, ideologies. They want Jesus to force himself on others. They want a revolution. They want Jesus to be a revolutionary, and Jesus won't. Some want him to be a disciplinarian. You know, on that day, some longed to see Jesus rebuke the sinners and condemn the unrighteous, and they wanted him to dole out punishment on the guilty, upon the immoral, upon those whose lifestyles were impure. Same is true today. There are many people that want Jesus to be a disciplinarian, to judge people harshly because of their sin, because of their immoral acts, because of their past failures. And Jesus won't do that. And some wanted him to be a wonder worker. Some in that crowd that day showed up believing that Jesus was a wonder worker because he was the feeder of 5,000, right? He was the walker on water. He was the healer of the sick. And they wanted that next miracle. And they wanted that next wonder that he could perform. How could Jesus benefit their lives? What would be their blessing for showing up? You know, today, many people still long for Jesus to be their personal wonder worker and to fill their lives with abundance and with wealth. They want Jesus to make sure they have everything that they want. And yet everything fell apart for this king one week later. All of these expectations that people had of Jesus, all of them fell through. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a Sunday, and on Friday he was executed. Why? Because Jesus is the king of his kingdom. His purpose and his plans are greater than anything that we can ever think of. And when that reality hit that crowd, well, one of his disciples betrayed him, and the rest of them ran away. When that reality hit that crowd, that Jesus is the king of his kingdom, that crowd changed their tune. And all of a sudden they stopped shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and they started shouting, crucify him, crucify him. What changed? Jesus showed us who he really is. So back in the 50s, Parker Brothers came out with a game, specifically for church families. It was called Going to Jerusalem. This is a real, legitimate game from the 50s. It's the same company that came out with the game of Monopoly. But now your playing piece wasn't a top hat, wasn't a little Scotty dog, and the goal of the game wasn't to destroy your opponent like Monopoly is. So this is the game going to Jerusalem, and you got to be a real disciple. And your player piece was a little plastic man with a robe and a beard and sandals and a staff. And here's how the game worked. So to move across the board, you looked up answers to questions in a little black New Testament that was provided with the game. And you always started at Bethlehem, and you made stops at the Mount of Olives and, and Bethsaida and Capernaum and the Stormy Sea and Nazareth and Bethany. And if you rolled the dice well and you answered the questions well, you went all the way to the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But that's where the game ended. You never got to the crucifixion. You never got to the resurrection. You know, in this game, there were no angry Pharisees that challenged you. There were no sick people that you needed to heal. There were no demons that you needed to cast out. You only made your way through the nice stories. It was a very safe adventure, very perfectly uh, suited for a Christian family. But what a contrast from reality. Because traveling with Jesus isn't meant for plastic disciples who look up verses in a little black Bible. Traveling with Jesus means that we change our expectations. Because it's not about my kingdom. It's about God's kingdom. Remember, Jesus is the king of his kingdom. We want Jesus to be the king of our kingdom. But he won't. Because what we need more than anything is Jesus to be the king of his kingdom. And that's exactly what he did. And he accomplished exactly what needed to be done. This is who Jesus is. 
This is the role of a king that's willing to take on suffering and dying for his people. Because Jesus took on his kingship because sin couldn't be overlooked. God created us with free wills, but our free wills eventually betray us. And we choose to sin. And we continue to choose to sin and rebel against God. And we do this all on our own. We were created to be in a relationship with God, but we have become marred by sin and its consequences. Isaiah 53, 6 says this, All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sin of us all. Sin could not be overlooked. It couldn't be swept under the rug. It needed to be addressed and paid for so that the kingdom could be whole again. It was God's love that motivated Jesus. God created us out of love, and that same love motivated him to act. And so Jesus became like us, and he lived among us, and he died to assume our punishment, and he settled, how much, and he settled once and for all how valued we are to God. He settled once and for all how much we matter to God and how much God wants to have us back. It says in Romans but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And because God's love could not be denied, it meant that a sacrifice could not be avoided. And so from the foundation of the world, he planned for the day that Jesus would assume the blame and he would take on the pain and he would take on the shame, and every guilty act would be laid upon him, and the penalty would be paid in full. Jesus willingly went to the cross. He joyfully went to the cross. He did it because he is the king of his kingdom, and his kingdom is all about restoration and forgiveness and eternity. Well, let me wrap things up. As we look at who Jesus is, that he is the king of his kingdom, let me ask you this. Is he your king? Is he your king? You know, the crowds wanted to crown him king. The Bible says at a different time that they intended to forcibly make him the king of Israel. They wanted Jesus to be their king, but they wanted him to govern over their kingdom. You know, we're no different. We want Jesus to bring about our kingdom. We want him to be something specific to us. And when he calls us to more, we're tempted to walk away from him. But Jesus is very clear that he is the king of his kingdom. And his kingdom is all about justice and mercy. And his kingdom is all about love and forgiveness and reconciliation. His kingdom is all about humility his kingdom is all about repentance and denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following after him. And the physical expression of his kingdom here on earth is us, his church. If we say that Jesus is our king, it has to mean that, we're about, that we are all about his kingdom too. If we say that Jesus is our king, it means that we are all about his kingdom, because that's what kingdom citizens do. And it's a calling that needs to impact every aspect of our lives. His kingdom governs how we spend our time, how we spend our resources. His kingdom governs how we treat our neighbor and our brother and our sister, and how we see them as fellow children of God. His kingdom governs how we interact with our co-workers and our jobs and our schooling and our careers. You know, I'm sure this morning, I'm sure this morning, if you were to take just a few moments and ask Jesus what part of my life isn't being governed by your kingdom, he'll tell you. He'll tell you. You won't need to spend a lot of time pondering it. And maybe that's the place that you need to begin. So I'm going to close in prayer. And I invite you to hear from God and what God wants to say to you. And as we're listening to God, here's what he's going to begin to tell you. I can't speak on behalf of God, but I think I know him enough to say that he's going to start by telling you how much he loves you. That he went to the cross for you. 
that he took on your sin and shame. And he rose again so that you could have eternal life with him. This is always God's first message to us. How much he loves us. And then his message is going to be about following after you. And he's going to say, come follow me. And discover what it means to live in freedom from sin. Come follow me and discover what forgiveness looks like for those that have wronged you and for the wrongs that you've done to others. Come follow me and discover what it means to substitute your burdens for my burdens and discover how this brings rest to your soul. Come follow me and discover what it means to live in my kingdom because this is what you were created for. This is where your life is found. So let's pray. Jesus, back then they claimed that you are the king and they were 100% right and 100% wrong. And God, today... Jesus, we proclaim that you are our king. And so we ask that you would speak to us and you would say, yes, I am your king. What does that mean in your life? God, would you remind us first of all of your incredible love for us, of your incredible desire to restore the kingdom, restore its citizens, to make a way where we couldn't make a way. You did this because your love motivated you to do it. God, would you remind us how much you love us? And then would you call us to follow after you? Would you call us to exchange our kingdom for your kingdom? And that we, that we, we would live that out in our lives. Because this is the life that you've called us to. This is filled with grace and peace and forgiveness and hope when we follow after your kingdom. God, speak to us. We're listening to you. We love you. And we want, we, we, we love you and, and, and we, we praise you. In your name we ask this. Amen.